Many years ago, when I was a seminarian, I was able to visit Mount Tabor, which is considered the traditional site for the transfiguration of our Lord. A zigzag path going up marked the way to the top of the mountain. Normally, it takes almost two hours to make it to the top. But when you have a group of eager, energetic, and task-oriented seminarians, it only takes 45 minutes. When we finally arrived at the top, out of breath, tired, and at the sight of a rested and smiling faculty just waiting for us, they took a taxi, we were bewildered. We were awestruck by the vista of the beautiful valley and the peace that was communicated in this graceful and isolated mountain in the lower Galilee. We were able to feel and sense that something marvelous took place there. Jesus at Mount Tabor gave some of the apostles a glimpse of His divine glory. Within the context of prayer, He shares with them an incredible sight. As Jesus prayed, He was taken up to another world. We see His face bathed in magnificence and light. Jesus is surrounded by Moses, the lawgiver, and Elijah, the prophet, designating him as the law of all laws and the prophet of all prophets. Therefore, Jesus is law, lawgiver, prophet, and divine. This event helped the apostles who were still trying to figure him out. It all points to Jesus' mission involving his suffering and death. We must remember that he's going to Jerusalem, and Jerusalem meant Calvary, and Calvary meant the cross. Life tells us that nothing worthwhile is ever simple or straightforward. In Jesus' transfiguration, we see a connection between suffering and death, the resurrection and the glory. The Lord's transfiguration is also meant to fortify the faith in those who believe in Him. He speaks about the gradual process of change that takes place in our lives when we accompany Jesus. We are called to walk with Jesus. We are called to accompany Him in His search for the truth, for the beautiful and the divine. In other words, we must be with Him in His love for people, in His sufferings, and in His resurrection. We are called to be one with Jesus as we take our daily worries and concerns, remembering that we are to be transformed and transfigured. Finally, Jesus' transfiguration is one of liberation. When Peter suggests the construction of three tents, he doesn't really know what he's asking. He cannot limit a moment of grace to time and space. God is bigger than that. God is a free reality calling us also to be free of anything that stands in the way of our own salvation and transfiguration. But Jesus' transfiguration is not a thing of the past. He continues to be transfigured as we celebrate the Eucharist and allow Him to transform bread and wine into His body and blood. He continues to be transfigured as we enable others to change their physical and spiritual quality of life, remembering that whatever we do for others, we're also doing it for Jesus. When we help them to change, Jesus also changes. When we change, 
when we convert, when we turn our hearts to the Lord, we become also transfigured into something luminous, holy. We become a likeness and image of God, His icon, which is Jesus, His beloved Son. Many years ago, I was honored to witness the death of a very holy woman. As she approached her last moment of earthly life, she took one last breath and her face became radiant, peaceful and beautiful. I am convinced that she saw the face of God. She was transfigured. Even close to death, we are called to do so. We call upon God so that we may be able to continue seeing His glory in all, so that we may be transfigured. Only in such we shall be immortal, and only in such we shall be one with Him.